I believe strongly that the more we can understand the reasons why things are uncomfortable, the more we can embrace things that are uncomfortable so that they can make us better people. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes we deal with chronic pain because we're withdrawn from the things we need to do simply because those things are uncomfortable. All right, everyone, welcome to Heal Thyself. Some of you are in pain, both emotional and physical pain, and you don't even know it. Because we get so used to being in pain, so adapted to pain. I mean, this is the survivability aspect. Our body knows how to handle pain. And I said emotional wound or physical wound, they both play into the same thing. Now, we have a pain expert, both on the emotional and the physical. Dr. Sean Pastuch or Dr. Sean, he spent years around healthcare and fitness. And the connection between emotional wounds and pain as an emotion... Again, the physical sensations that we have are going to have an emotional piece. So this show is for you if you're living in any sort of pain. Again, the deep down inside, deep wound in your body, or the physical wound. Let's say an ankle pain or a knee pain that doesn't go away. And there's an emotional response always tied to it. So we learn how to eliminate that chronic pain that we're living in. We learn what are the number one things that we have to do in our belief system, in our subconscious, how to reframe our relationship with pain. And listen, this special guest segment might be irritating or uncomfortable or triggering, just like the pain we live in. So Dr. Sean is going to highlight what are the things that we need to do to reframe our relationship to pain. And it's going to be so powerful because he's going to give us tangible ways to restructure our subconscious so we begin to do the things that we've told ourselves that we can't do because we've been living in physical and emotional pain. I cannot wait for this episode, understanding that we all have the power to make the decision to change our lives in the context of pain. Let's listen to this episode. It's going to be amazing. Get your notepad out. Can repressed emotions cause physical chronic pain? The word repressed in there is something that I think um, goes a little bit beyond my particular scope, but the answer to emotions causing pain is uh, absolutely. And my belief is that pain actually is an emotion. It's a negative emotion. It's associated with uncertainty, which brings on fear. And the simplest way to think about that is we've all gotten a massage once in our lives. And the massage therapist pressed on a spot and we said, ow. And the massage therapist said, oh, does that hurt? And we said, yeah. And said, do you want me to stop? And we said, no, no, no. It's, this is the good pain. I need this. And in that moment, we felt safe, even though we were uncomfortable. But then, in our real world, outside of the massage therapy office, off of the table, when we're walking around, when we're playing with our kids, when we're sitting at our desk, when we're driving our car, when we get out of bed in the morning we feel something significantly less intense than what we felt while we were laying on the table with the massage therapist. And we decide to withdraw from it. Why? It's because we're not sure what we're feeling. We're not in the belief that we're supposed to be experiencing what we're currently experiencing. And so the things that make us feel that way are the things that we start to avoid. And so we end up in this vicious cycle of, if it makes me feel uncomfortable, I'm going to stop doing it. One of the reasons why I was most excited to come on your podcast is I hear you speak about identity, emotions, personal development, understanding of thyself. And I believe strongly that the more we can understand the reasons why things are uncomfortable, the more we can embrace things that are uncomfortable so that they can make us better people. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes we deal with chronic pain because we're withdrawn from the things we need to do simply because those things are uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's sort of a reflection, the physical pain and withdrawing from physical pain as we see in our own emotional pain, which we withdraw from by doing other things like being on our phone or being overly social or workaholism or whatever addictions that we get into. Um, so it's always been fascinating, the pain aspect. And I read a few doctors uh, treating pain from the emotional standpoint and actually having fantastic results because mm -hmm. they're seeing that this chronic pain is connected to emotions. I've seen it myself too, with my own hands, with my own eyes. Our next partner is AG1. AG1 is a daily foundational nutritional supplement. And what it does is support your whole body health it's got a science-backed 
formula of vitamins, probiotics, whole food source, nutrients, and AG1 delivers comprehensive support to the full body, but most specifically, you're gonna see it in the brain, the gut, and the immune system. I hate taking millions of supplements. It's one of my biggest pet peeves. Um, I don't think people should be taking so many, but you wanna make sure you're efficient. AG1 is a really easy way to be efficient by covering your nutritional bases with one delicious scoop. Now, if you wanna take ownership over your health, you wanna make sure you're getting a quality powder that is chock full of vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, probiotics, all of the herbals that are really gonna up level and boost up your health. So it starts with AG1. Try AG1 for a free one year supply of vitamin D and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. This is my go-to for the morning, sometimes lunch, but mostly the morning. Go to drinkag1.com slash heal thyself. That's drinkag1.com slash heal thyself to check it out and start up-leveling your morning routine. When it comes to physical pain, physical pain. I, I mentioned we have the opioid epidemic. Uh, is it that we in America are just taught and conditioned from an early age to withdraw from pain? And how is that different from other places in the world where they don't necessarily have access to all those medications or, or pain reducers? Well, I believe that a lot of our problems come from the way that we try to solve problems. And so because our economy in the United States is strong as it compares to the rest of the world, we have means that other countries never even considered. And so we have the ability to sit on a couch, to watch a TV with a remote control, to drive from point A to point B in a car, to make our money with our minds, all of these things. In other places in the world, and I'm not just talking about third world countries or developing countries. I'm talking about places where people are working with their hands, even in the United States, in, in the middle of the country where people are working on farmland often. That's not a choice. Deciding I'm in too much pain to do my thing, I need to medicate to withdraw from the pain. It's not a choice for these people. They have to find a way to continue to do the work that they do that sustains their life. But societally in the United States, especially in the big cities, we're looking for all of the different ways that we can make things easier for us so that we can do all of the things that pain gets in the way of. And so instead of taking the time, spending the money, spending the energy to resolve whatever it is that's driving the pain, we spend the money, get the time back, and mute the pain. Medication mutes the pain. And I'm empathetic, by the way, to people who are dealing with severe chronic pain. It's not a fun thing to do. If it's okay, I'll share a short story with you about my own experience with it. I have some severely herniated discs in my neck. And about a year ago, so July 4th weekend last year, my daughter, I have a four-year-old, a six-year-old, and an eight-year-old. She was five at the time. She says to me, Daddy, can I sit on your shoulders? We're walking home from a block party. And I was in the middle of a pretty severe bout of neck pain where I couldn't even turn my head to the side or anything like that, which is a little bit, I feel ashamed to say it. I'm a little bit embarrassed to say it because I own a company that helps people get out of pain without going to the doctor or giving up their life. And I should be a client of my own company. This prompted me to become one. But I said no to her. I said, I, 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 no, I'm not going to put you on my shoulders. And she said, why not? I said, I just don't want to right now. And in that moment... I realized I just lied to my kid. And I didn't lie to my kid because she was afraid of something that was irrational to be afraid of. I didn't lie to my kid because, uh, I, I don't know, I needed her to... Parents lie to their kids sometimes about things that are inconsequential. Maybe it's not the best habit in the yeah. world, but it's, it's, we're imperfect. But this was a lie that felt different. It was the first time I realized that I had lied to my daughter, who I love dearly, who one day is going to be too old to want to sit on my shoulders, and that's what I'm really going to want around my shoulders, mm -hmm. because of the way I was feeling. And I have control over how that emotion affects me. I have control over how my body physically feels, not in that moment, but in general, and I hadn't done anything about it. So effectively, I had chosen to mute that until my daughter figuratively screamed so loud by asking me a quiet question that I had to change things about my life. Mm. Mm. That's powerful to think about that 
someone you love so much can hit that right nerve in your body mm -hmm. to make those major changes. And how many of us are really dealing with pain in our bodies and sort of ignoring it, withdrawing, and need something like as, as dramatic as even just a daughter's whisper going, why not, mm -hmm. to shake us up? And I want us to all think about like, what is your pain teaching you, right? Because it, it, it obviously is. It, it wouldn't be there for a mistake. And I'm, I'm a firm believer even a bigger picture synchronicity of like, if I fall on the ice and have a hip problem, it's that's not a mistake either. I don't believe in accidents like that. I believe in synchronicity. Um, so with that said, when we come back to the person to person picture, it, when we have that emotional pain, how is it manifesting as physical? Is it a muscle thing? Is it a fascia thing? Is it a nervous system thing? It's a nervous system thing. And if, if we can, I've, like you said earlier, you've seen with your own body, with your own eyes, with your own hands, the number of people who tell me they feel better before I've ever touched them when I was in clinic, before we've ever prescribed them a workout, before we've ever done anything with them, is, is a number that would, would, if I really went back and looked at every phone call, we've had 14,000 clients over the last eight years, it would be a staggering number of people who said, I feel better already before we did anything. That's because pain is a negative emotional response that's directly tied to uncertainty about something that we're feeling. Now, if we're focusing right now on the physical manifestation of pain, like my knee hurts, my neck hurts, I like to go to the example of headaches, and I'll, it'll make sense in a moment. Right now, for someone listening to this, if you just started immediately getting pain in the back of your eyeball, I'm like, oh, that's, that's odd. And it was like a one to two on a scale of one to 10. You're like, this is weird. And then it just progressively got worse. And then you started to see color. And you're like, whoa, this is bad. And then you started to get nauseous. And then you were like, I can't, the light is really bothering me. If this never happened to you before, how much pain would that cause? What would you do about it? Hmm. You'd probably be afraid you're having, am I having a stroke? Am I dying? Is something terrible happening to me? To the person who suffers from migraines, that's a Tuesday. They know exactly what to do. Hmm. And they don't end up going to the doctor for it. And it's not fun for them. But their response to it is not as heightened as ours. The, or yours if, you, if you've never experienced that. And the reason for that is they have abundant certainty around what is happening right now. The first symptom that comes on, they know what the next six hours are going to feel like. The person who's never felt that, their fear goes up and up and up as they start to feel these things. That's an example of our lack of certainty around why something is happening, causing us to experience more pain. And all of that pain comes from our neurological response to that physical sensation. The same is true if three people are walking down the sidewalk. One of them is an ex-professional football player. One of them is a retired WWE wrestler. And the third never played sports, never got into a fight, never hurt themselves growing up. They're walking down the sidewalk. They all trip and they all fall at the exact same time and they have the exact same response in terms of what happens to their body. They skin their knees. They, they tear some skin on their hands the wrestler and the football player are going to have a different response to the person who's never seen their own blood before. Why? They had the exact same injury. They're not tougher than the other person. They don't have a different nervous system than the other person. They don't have different skin. They don't have different muscles. They don't have different blood. They have different experiences. They know I'm going to survive this. Mm -hmm. It's why a child screams when they get a paper cut. They don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. So pain is amplified by, by, by abundance of uncertainty. Let's take a quick pause. I'm gonna talk about sleep. 70 million Americans have chronic sleep issues and 50% of Americans deal with sleep deprivation. I know that might've been you at some point. One of our favorite brands across the board here on Heal Thyself is the most super transparent one, one of the most, Ned. And it's here to help you with an incredible new product. It's called Shut Eye Chai. It's inspired by 5,000 years of ancient healing tradition and is Ned's biggest product launch to date. It's a mellow super blend latte for sleep that combines adaptogens, aminos, functional mushrooms, and magnesium. Seriously, some of the best ingredients out there, and it's wrapped in a heavenly masala chai-inspired spice body. And it's got ingredients like chaga, reishi, ashwagandha, and they're deeply nourishing to the body and help send you off to dreamland. Probably my favorite thing 
aside from the delicious products, the efficacious products, are just Ned's ability to share their third-party lab reports, who farms their products, all the way to the extraction process. They share it on their website. They're open about it if you ask for it. Really transparent company who's proud of their products. Shout Out Chai does not contain any CBD, caffeine, melatonin, or dairy, and it's part of my nightly routine and something I actually find myself looking forward to every single day. It tastes good, it smells good, it makes me feel calm and at ease. So if you are interested in trying the Shut Eye Chai, it can revolutionize your sleep. You're going to get 15% off with the code DRG. Go to hellonet.com slash DRG, enter the code DRG at checkout. That's H-E-L-L-O-N-E-D.com slash DRG to get 15% off in the sweetest, sweetest of dreams. Hmm. So we have a lifetime's worth of experiences that are sort of showing us, okay, I, I know what this pain means. Mm -hmm. So so you're saying this is why, and actually when you said that, I remember the first time I ever felt heartburn, I thought I was having a heart attack. There you go. And I was like, I need to go to the hospital right now because it, it, I can't breathe. Mm -hmm. It's like so sharp. And the guy's like, you just have heartburn. Yeah. And I was like, all right, cool. And he's like, take this medication. I was like, at the time I was like, all right, cool. Mm -hmm. And... uh and it, it, that's, that's what came up because imagine someone who regularly has heartburn, unfortunately doesn't do anything about it, but regularly right. has heartburn. They're like, oh, you know, I just, this is what's going on. I, I had a spicy meal or my stomach is feeling this way. Well, and you were talking about synchronicity before and there, there's synchronicity that is, that is less meta than what you were describing. Mm -hmm. And that's our body. Our body functions as a system. It's not a bunch of different pieces that function on their own. So... You had heartburn. The doctor gave you medication not get rid of the heartburn, but they didn't get rid of the problem that caused the heartburn in the first place. Mm -hmm. How do we do that? That's what we should all be focused on. Your knee hurts. Why does your knee hurt? I heard it in high school. Well, so did that person, and then he doesn't hurt anymore. What's the difference between you and them? What is it possible that there's something you can do to remove the pain you're having in your knee, to restore function in your knee? The, mm -hmm. Like, Forget about what you have financial means for. Is it possible? And I'll give you, and if the answer is yes, then pursue it. The, and I'm not, I'm not saying that callously, like it doesn't matter what it costs. I'm saying exhaust all of the things that are within your ability so that you can live a life that you once scripted for yourself and now believe maybe it's not possible anymore. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you something that's really close to me on that. If you went to a restaurant with a bunch of friends and one of your friends opened the menu and is like, ah. Oh, such a bad reader, and then close the menu. How many times would you go to dinner with that person before you were like, yo, you got to learn how to read, man. Mm -hmm. And you got to stop saying this about yourself. It wouldn't be many for people who, who want the people around them to improve. Not, not for selfish reasons, just because they want them to live better lives. But we allow our friends, we allow our families to say things like, I have a bad knee, I have a bad back, I have a bad shoulder. And then they become that thing. So somebody shows up and they say, when they show up for sports with you, like I've seen you train martial arts. If they're going to do martial arts with you and they say, oh, I have a bad knee. So I, there's some things I won't be able to do. Well, they put limitations on themselves before they started. And whether you want that to infect you or not, there, there are subconscious things that we can't control. Now you're going to treat the situation with that person differently. So they end up living a life that is a result of the way they communicate with themselves and as a result of that, how they communicate with the world. Mm. And it could be better. And that's the role of identity that you were talking about with me before. Mm -hmm. It was your identity dictates really your self-talk and your self-talk dictates what you say out loud and then how people relate to you. Mm -hmm. So would you say then one of the first steps for healing from chronic pain to be first starting with your identity? The first step to eliminating chronic pain is to adopt the belief that you can eliminate your chronic pain. That's the first step. So if, if that is a representation of your identity changing, mm -hmm. sure. The hard thing for me day to day is I want to help everybody. I can only help people who have decided yeah. I'm helpable. I would like I, when I when I figure out how to spend my time and my energy convincing people who today think that it's not possible for them to believe that it is, 
I will put my time and energy into that. But right now, the number one thing that you need to have is the belief that you can change, the belief that you can live a better life. I do believe that there's some identity to that. I think that there are people who live in the victim mind and there are people who live in the growth mind, the, the personal responsibility yeah. mind. I was, I was searching for that word. So yes, if you're someone who today doesn't have personal responsibility, that's the first step is adopting the personality of somebody who does. But there are a lot of people for whom they already have that. And so that's not the first step for them. Changing their identity is not the first step. The first step is taking a look at all the things that they've done and drawing correlates and saying, why haven't any of these things worked? What is something totally unlike these things that would allow me to become more successful? And to me, that's, that starts with education. Mm, having that education around it. Yeah. So like we, we have our... We just launched our first brick and mortar store in Long Beach, New York, the other coast. And on the sign, it says education, exercise, mentorship. Mm. Working out, exercise, that's the, it just happens because these people prioritize their health. The reality is we're, we're helping people think better about what they're thinking about. Mm -hmm. And that leads to, to much more robust solutions for mm -hmm. them. I mean, I've seen it in my own practice, the People who come in and go, eh, I'm only here because my wife sort of signed me up for this. Mm -hmm. She said, I need it. They're not ready to heal. They do not heal. No. It's the people who've been like, Dr. G, I've been through so much. I saw this and I, I don't know. I'm just ready. I'm so tired of, oh my God. Those are the people with, when they're shaking and like mm -hmm. removing these, these repressed emotions or moving these repressed emotions, they come out and they have a new face. Like mm -hmm. literally their face is just so much calmer. Their shoulders are down, they're grounded, their energy's different, and they're like, I feel different. So until that happens, there's a huge difference, right? And why then do so many of us go, oh, this is just part of my, like, this, my knee should be bad. I, I messed it up in high school. Why then are so many people not ready to have that healing? And why have we accepted that we're living with pain and that's set in stone? It's a combination of things. Uh, it's a combination of forces of economy, so our medical system is set up to numb that stuff. We have, we have fantastic doctors. We were introduced by Dr. Gabrielle Lyon. Yeah. There are so many doctors out there who want more than what the system can allow for right now. But the overwhelming majority are a part of the system. And so those are the people in society who have status. Those are the people in society who have influence. And their entire livelihood is built around a patient walks into my office, they want to be relieved of their pain. The fastest way I can do that is to connect them to my friend over here, the pharmaceutical company. They start taking the medication, they start to feel better, I solve their problem. We need to walk into that doctor's office and speak differently. And so the, the reason why we're stuck is our communication, and our communication is a result of our education. If you walked into a doctor's office and you said, hey, my back hurts and it only hurts when I go on a long hike whatever, pick your thing. And the doctor says, okay, take this muscle relaxer and this anti-inflammatory and your pain will go away. Also, stop hiking so much. They did their job based on what you described you came in for. I want the pain to go away. How do I get the pain to go away? Mm -hmm. Stop doing the thing that causes the pain. But that's not really what you went in for. What you really went in for was, I want to still be able to do the things that I do without the pain. How do I do that? That requires a totally different 180 thought process from that doctor. What's relieving to me is I believe through my experiences and my conversations, most doctors would prefer to have that conversation with you, but most people don't walk in wanting to have that conversation. And so if the doctor impresses that conversation upon a person who doesn't want it, that person pushes back and it's bad for that doctor's practice. It's bad for that doctor's emotion. They have a bad day. So they just give people what they think they want. And that's 90% of people's, they're coming in for that. Be one of the 10%. Tell the doctor what you really want. That's reason number one why I think we're stuck in this pattern. Reason number two is our social circles. I imagine that for you, you're a successful guy. For you to become a successful guy, and I don't mean just financially, I mean in terms of you know who you are, you know what you stand for, and I imagine you have some, some business success. You change the people that you're surrounding yourself with when you want something different than what you have right now. 
And it's not an excommunication of the people who you used to be around. It's a reprioritization of the time that you're spending and what you're going to learn. Um, one of my favorite expressions is you never want to be the nicest house on the block. I want people around me who make me better. I have friends who I think are better dads than I am. They don't make as much money as I do. They don't, um, they're not as fit as I am, mm. but they're better dads. And they're in my social circle because I want to be a better dad. I have friends around me who make more money than I do. I want to learn how to make more money. I have friends around me who have more impact. I want to learn how to have more impact. And I have people who are in my circle who I do each of those things better than they do and they come and get that value from me. Mm. And I think that a lot of people right now who are listening to this, if they said, if I told people in my life that I'm going to get rid of my back pain, there is a way, the people around me would think I'm crazy. And they would make fun of me and they would laugh at me and they would, when I came back and it wasn't better two days later, they would just be like, ha, told you. You have to stop hanging out with those people. Yeah. Uh, I have an example that, that actually just happened today. Yesterday I gave a presentation on uh, the psychology of sales and the idea that we don't sell to make money. We sell because this person has a problem and we believe that we're the person who can help solve that problem. Or we don't and we sell them on allowing us to connect them to somebody who does. Mm. And this woman sent me a DM after the conversation. She said how moved, how, how moved she was by it. She held back the tears. She's like, I was having tears and I was holding them back. And what struck me is who taught you that you're supposed to hold those tears back? Where did you learn that you're not supposed to cry? Did somebody tell you that that makes you weak? Did somebody tell you that that makes you undesirable? And when did you start to believe it? And I asked her all of those questions. And she opened up and it was really cool. She said, well, when I was young. It was very, it was very well known that my, my father wanted boys, but he had me. And so he just raised me like a boy. Mm. And my mom used to cry a lot. And my father would make, and, and she didn't mean like just for no reason. Like she would well up at a movie. She'd read a book. She'd cry. She'd tell a story. She'd cry. And her dad would make fun of her mom for it. And then she had brothers. The dad taught the brothers, we don't cry. So she identify she wanted dad's love. So she decided I'm not going to cry. I'm going to hold back tears. Mm. And what was interesting is she actually started to make fun of her mom the way her brothers and her dad did for crying when she would cry. She's like, it wasn't that we had a bad relationship. I just, it was what we did to fit in. Mm. And now, interestingly enough, my kids make fun of me when I start to cry. Mm. And so I held the tears back and I challenged her. I said, I, I, if it's okay, I'd like to challenge you to do something that's probably going to be very difficult. Are you open to it? She said, yes. I said, I want you to break that cycle. I want you to share with your kids the value of crying when you feel tears coming to your eyes. I want you to share with your kids the value of steeping in your emotions so that you can start to think about why you're feeling that way. Do I like how I'm feeling? How did I get here? Do I dislike how I'm feeling? How did I get here? so that you can start to craft the life that you want to live instead of holding back the tears, which holds back the emotion, which holds back the change. Mm -hmm. And ultimately is going to manifest at some point in pain in the body. No doubt about it. No and her, for her, it was um, significant weight gain. Yeah. It, it, and we're not just talking about like, okay, my knee hurts. We're also talking about manifestations of physical sure. disease like obesity maybe or just weight gain. One of the things I struggle with the most in my communication is I, I talk about pain. And because I see pain as an emotion that manifests in all different ways, mm -hmm. the perception is I'm always talking about the physical. Right. And I'm almost never talking about the physical. But sometimes the, the thing most people relate to is the physical pain. But I didn't, I, I struggled really, really bad in my life. And I don't mean like, I didn't grow up in a bad neighborhood. I grew up in a phenomenal family. I'm, I'm, Mark Bell has a quote that I love. I, have, I had a performance-enhancing performance drug as a child that was parents who loved me unconditionally. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. It was, it was, uh, it's a great one. So I'm not complaining. Don't, don't, don't play the smallest violin in the world for me. But I was working 18-hour days as a doctor, an event owner, and a gym owner. And I was making less than $30,000 a year. And I was angry. I felt alone. I felt emasculated. I was married. My wife was the one earning all the money for the mm -hmm. family. And I hired a mentor who told me, if you want to be more successful, you need to become a better person. And that led to me 
sharing my emotions with people. I feel this way. It's, you didn't make me feel any way. You did a thing for you. And I decided to feel this way about it. And once I started to understand all of that, I was able to start to take control of my life. Mm -hmm. Of course, because you're connected to the expression of what wants to move through the body. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's the highest point of really authentic self. If you can connect to your expression fearlessly, then not only do you learn what's happening, you're just embodying a new state of yourself. Americans spend so much time indoors, 90% of their time. 20,000 breaths we take, did you know that? Now, according to the EPA, indoor air is two to five times more polluted than outdoor air, and in some cases, 100 times more polluted. And data shows that air pollution is responsible for nearly 7 million premature deaths. That's crazy, I bet you didn't know that. Some of you may know that I've actually been struggling a lot with mold in the home and mold exposure. One of my saving graces have been the Air Doctor air purifiers. It's some of the best ones out there. It's been featured across many media outlets, CNN, Money, ABC. Filters out 99.99% of dangerous contaminants and allergens, such as pollen, pet dander, dust mites, but mold and bacteria and viruses as well, so your lungs don't have to. And air purifiers, are essential for the home. A quality one, like Air Doctor, is even more essential. And I always recommend this to people. I've been doing it since 2019. It's got also a whisper jet fan, so it's 30% quieter than the ordinary air purifier. Now, I personally have the Air Doctor. I have it in my room and every other room. I have one in my kitchen. Let's see, I have one in the living room. I have one in the hallway. And I got a tinier one near the front door. And Air Doctor is so important for our respiratory health and cleaning up our home air, which is something I love talking about. Anyway, Air Doctor comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee, so if you don't love it, just send it back for a refund minus shipping. Head to airdoctorpro.com, use the promo code DRG, and depending on the model, you can receive up to 39% off or up to $300 off. Yeah. You will also receive a free three-year warranty on any unit. That's an additional $84 value. The deal is only available for you, the Heal Thyself listener. So lock this special offer and go to airdoctorpro.com, A-I-R-D-O-C-T-O-R-P-R-O.com and use the promo code for you, DRG. So how's your life been lately? It feels like mine is a never-ending hustle, at least sometimes, especially when it's on the go, on the go, on the go. The constant juggling of responsibilities and the endless to-do lists, I know a lot of you are suffering with this stuff, it seems impossible and can be overwhelming. Now, I'm not even talking about how these things affect your overall being your sleep, your productivity, your immune system. Sleep slowly infiltrates your life, silently robbing you of one of the most important minerals out there, magnesium. It's a vicious stress magnesium deficiency cycle. You might've heard about it. In simple terms, basically your stress, a lot of life today and the way it's constructed keeps us in a stress state and your body needs magnesium to buffer it and it's losing it, it's losing it and losing it. Your adrenals need that magnesium. Sleep becomes elusive, energy and productivity just plummet and just stress levels skyrocket even more and more magnesium is leaving your body. So how do you break this stress magnesium deficiency cycle? You gotta take some good quality magnesium. And I've been such a proponent of magnesium being one of the few supplements to take. And Magnesium Breakthrough from Bio-Optimizers is one of my favorite. It contains all seven forms of magnesium, which might support stress management from promoting muscle relaxation, regulating the nervous system, controlling stress hormones, enhancing your brain function, boosting energy. What doesn't it do? Improve sleep. You can take two capsules before bed and it works. This is what I do. Give it a shot, break free from that vicious cycle, and you got nothing to lose. You might find yourself sleeping better, your muscles better, your nervous system better, your brain better. Bio-Optimizers are so confident that their product is of high quality that they're offering a risk-free 365-day money-back guarantee. If you don't see results, just call them up for a refund. No questions asked, it's a win-win. How do you get this magnesium? Go to magbreakthrough.com slash DRG. Enter the code DRG10 for 10% off of any order for a limited time only receive special guests with the purchase. The offer is only available through magbreakthrough.com slash DRG. Do not miss an opportunity to improve your well-being and life. Is it okay if I push back on that a little bit? Yeah. Um, one of the things I teach my daughters is 
the word courage or bravery, will it be synonymous, is having fear and taking action despite it. Mm -hmm. I don't, I think most of the things I do um, are not fearless. There's a lot of fear in my life day to day. I think the thing that's allowed me to ascend from where I was in a previous life is the decision to do it anyway. And so I just, I wanted to give someone who's listening to this the permission to understand if you're afraid, I think what you're saying is not to disregard it, not to not experience it, but to understand that, that that's there for a reason. Now our responsibility is to act accordingly and not to withdraw simply because it's there. Yeah. I mean, well, it's a choice, right? It's like, here is the contraction that I feel. Mm -hmm. Here's a contraction I've been taught and conditioned with. I know in my body that's representative of fear. Mm -hmm. And I'm choosing to not go back to that contraction and instead expand. Yes. And that expansion may seem like a, or may look like an emotional experience, or like you said, crying, or, or you giving the lady permission to cry instead of contracting. Mm -hmm. So that I, I see fear as the contraction in the body right. and, and in the psyche. So you're seeing fear as an action. I, I'm seeing fear as a feeling in the body and an an action as the choice whether that. to stay contracted and you know shut your voice or shut your emotions or stay tight or the choice of the expression of oh fuck it I'm tired of this. I like that. <sighs> right like and that. and whether it's a scream or however you want to express or maybe you want to dance, maybe you want to sing. How many of us have contracted when we want to sing? Mm -hmm. Like that's one of I mean, all kids sing. Do your kids sing when they were, when they the were little? All the time, right? All the time. Too much. Yeah, too much. <laughs> I did. What happens when we get older, right? It's like we're told our voice isn't good. We're told that we can't hit that note. We're told that it's embarrassing. Be mm -hmm. quiet. And for me, that's such a deep um, barometer of where someone is in their emotional health. Mm -hmm. Because if they can't allow themselves to sing, they're not going to allow themselves to really express a lot of what's in there. You know, as I was going through really the, the, the dark period, I'm overblowing it. I don't want people to think I'm, I'm over here talking like I was in this really depressed, dark state. Uh, I don't want to over-describe it, but when I, it, for me, it was the worst thing that's ever happened to you is the worst thing that's ever happened to you. And this is the worst thing that's ever happened yeah. to me, right? Realizing that I wasn't who I thought I was and then having to figure out who I was. That was a really dark month and a half of my life. And I remember a day in that when I was outside and I was walking along and I was humming loudly to myself. And every time somebody would walk in the other direction and get close to me, I'd stop. Yeah. And I remember in the moment being like, what are you doing, man? Why are you stopping? Why is their presence yeah. impacting your own ability and desire to hum? And so I just decided that day to, fuck it, I'm going to do it no matter who's around. That's good. Uh, and that doesn't mean I walk into the grocery store and I start belting out ballads, Yeah. right? It just, it just means like, I don't have to hum extremely loud for everyone to hear, but if I have a song in my head and I'm enjoying it and I'm dancing around, I'm going to do it regardless mm. of where I am. And I wonder how someone's experience in relation to pain would change in that humming moment where they allow themselves to hum in front of someone or start singing in front of someone or get used to a practice where they're singing every single day. My hunch is their relationship, maybe the pain intensity goes down a little bit or maybe it's the same, mm -hmm. but I think the relationship would be different because it's hard to be in full amount of pain when you're singing from your heart. I think it's a, it's a chicken and an egg. Mm -hmm. So what I find is oftentimes one of the things that we have to help people who come to us with is, uh, I want you to think about why you're saying sorry before you say sorry next time. People often apologize for being themselves. And, and when you do that, what you're doing is you just keep on putting yourself at the back of the line. And I don't think someone who's apologizing for everything is, is going to be humming mm -hmm. and, or dancing or skipping, whatever your thing is, smiling. People who are chronic apologizers are, are the people who I see the, the most opportunity for fast change because you're apologizing for the way that you, you showed up and you have nothing to apologize for. And I, that, that this came up to me because you were talking about the presence of happiness and humming and things of that nature. 
and the thing that just stood out to me is the people who I identify very quickly, like we, we can help you if you believe you can be helped, is if you find yourself saying sorry for who you are over and over and over again. That is a very telltale sign that as soon as you realize you have nobody to apologize to, life changes. Yeah. I've seen that with people pleasers. Mm -hmm. it, it, when they really connect back to themselves and that anger that they're holding, it's, it's really a massive change on their experience. Mm -hmm. Is there a personality type to people who are in chronic pain? I don't think so. Um, I'm not a psychologist. What I've, the way I think about personality is very rudimentary. Uh, that first mentor who I hired identified for me that I'm, I'm a very unrelatable person at my core. Very unrelatable. He, he took us through a bunch of different evaluations, Myers-Briggs being one of them. And I remember him saying, this is, this is the scope for normal. From here to here is like a normal everyday person. Red flags are here. Sean, you're over here on the other side of the red flag in every category, mm. um, which I took as a compliment. I mean, you're fucking right. I'm one of a kind. Yeah. Uh, but I didn't have the ability to use empathy. I didn't know how to feel what other people were feeling or to put myself in their shoes. And so he taught me a very simple way to think about personalities, and it was to build four quadrants of people. And those quadrants are on two continuums the speed and the amount of information with which they make decisions. So people all the way to the right need very little information. People all the way to the left need a lot of information. And then whether their decisions are driven by logic or by emotion. And so at the, all the way at the top, you have people who are highly logical, people at the bottom who are highly emotional. And once I was able to see that, I was able to understand, okay, this is not a you're box one, box two, box three, box four. You're a moving target at all times. But I make decisions faster than you, not you, proverbial you, or slower than you. And so if I make them faster than you, I need to make myself a little bit uncomfortable and give you more information before I can expect you to be comfortable to do something. I'm sharing all of this with you just for the sake of saying, I've seen people in all four of these categories and all gradients mm. experience chronic pain. Mm. Okay. So really, it, it, it holds no bounds in, in personality. Mm -hmm. um, but what about the people who go, and you kind of mentioned this in the beginning, I played football in high school. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a few injuries, mm -hmm. but I'm not living with them. Right. But I know some people from high school still who are like, I'm still hurt from that injury in, in high school. Mm -hmm. But I remember we didn't break a bone. We was just like really bad sprains, mm -hmm. you know? Why, why is he still living with it? What, there's, a lot of, there's a lot to unpack there. So the first thing is, the way I describe it is an injury is a decision. An injury is a decision that I can't do something. That's all an injury is. So there's four, there's four categories, and I'll make this really simple. Category one is insult. That's all the stuff that bombards our body all day long that we have no conscious awareness of. It's happening, but we don't feel it. Irritation is the moment that we start to feel something. That's all it is. I, I just had to change my position in my seat. I was irritated by the position I was previously in. I'm not hurt. I'm not injured. I'm not deciding I have to stop. But I move. Pain is the negative emotional response to that irritation. If I decide my hip is really bothering me, like, can we, can we cut? And yeah. That's, I'm in pain and I want to change something. Injury is the decision that I can't. I have to stop. I got, I got to get up. I got to, just give me a minute to clear this out. I imagine what, ha and what happens now is people say, I have a back injury. I have an ankle injury. That's interesting because you walked in here. So your ankle's working. Your back is working. Uh, you, you're able to do all the things. It seems like it just hurts you, yeah? Yeah, well, then that's not an injury. And it's not an ankle. What is it that you have pain doing? What is it that you're unable to do? Well, I can't walk on the outside of my foot, for example. Oh, so then you have a walking on the outside of your foot injury, not an ankle injury, because the whole ankle isn't messed up. Now, where that manifests a little bit further is it's highly possible that your friends who experienced these injuries when they were in high school playing football lost some part of their identity when they had that injury. 
They were no longer able to run as fast. They couldn't take a hit as well. They couldn't cut. So now their ability to play football comes down a little bit. And they walked around high school like, I'm a football player. I'm awesome. Look at me. Mm. And now they they don't believe that about themselves anymore. And so what happens is they may not realize it. And this may not be true, but I think it is for some of them. They decided, this is my excuse. This is my reason for not being who I was supposed to be. I was on my way to being this person and then this happened. And that said, and then this happened and then that happened. Mm. Still hurts, still hurts. Yeah, it sets like, them off. Yeah, and you're like, well, hold, hold on a second. <laughs> you're telling me that the ankle injury you had in high school affects the way you parent? Mm. It affects your income? It affects your relationship? It affects your health? That seems like too much. Yeah. Would you like to do something about that? And that's when we get into what we talked about earlier. The personality type, the identity of, it's nothing I can do. Or, yeah, man, I would love to do something about it. That's a person who is moments away from a new life. Mm. And, and it's possible. It's probable. It's probable. That's beautiful to hear because I, I still, I, I remember hearing people like, oh, man, I would have played at this college mm -hmm. had I not gotten this injury. But, the, but it's still part of their identity. Of course. I hear that a lot, actually. They scripted something. They scripted something. And that something. script didn't happen. The... the and they, they, they wrapped their whole value in that thing that they scripted coming true. Mm -hmm. They had no control over that thing. They never did. Mm. So when I say, yes, I have, I've had this ankle injury since high school when I got that sprain. Uh, and it's been, it's affecting everything. It affects, I can't dance anymore. I can't run on the beach with my friends. I don't play basketball anymore. But I say, yes, I'm tired of it. Is it a, as as we went over, it's it's a redefining of your relationship with it, mm -hmm. and then do I need like to strengthen something, another muscle? Do I need scans? Is there like a physical aspect now to it? We're gonna start between your ears. Okay. So we're gonna start by chunking that down. A friend of mine, Mark England, has a great company called Enlifted, where he teaches people how to uh, change their language to live a different life. And I'm probably minimizing it, but Mark, that's 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 your plug. Um. What we would start by doing is asking somebody for really specific and more accurate language around that. So the truth is your ankle hurts and you have an ankle injury, sure. Let's get a little more accurate about it. You said you can't dance at all. Hmm. Well, me, me, I can. Well, in general, they, yeah. they would say- But figuratively, oh, yeah. I mean, no. I mean, I can do some dancing, yeah, yeah, yeah. So. just not like I can't do these things. Okay, so let's reframe what you said. What can you do? I, I can dance some. Okay, what dancing What dancing are you unable to do? I can't do, what you end up landing at is, I just can't do this one or two things. Mm. And I won't dance at all if I can't do those one or two things. So now they identify as someone who can't dance. Do you follow me so far? Yeah. So now the, the more accurate language is, there are certain things that still bother my ankle when I dance. Mm. You just became a person who dances. Yeah. Like that. So now the next time you go to a wedding, you're going to dance. What is your wife or your husband or your friend, your boyfriend, girlfriend, whoever, what are they going to say when you get up and dance? How does that, like, I'm getting the chills talking about it right now. Their whole life changed because they decided there are certain things I still can't do with this ankle when I dance. And I dance. Mm -hmm. So now what's next is, okay, well, what are the things you still can't do? Still can't do this, still can't do this. Okay. Is it that you can't do them at all? Or is it that you can't do them repetitively? Huh. Never thought about that. Well, I can't do them repetitively because I can do it once or twice. Yeah. Okay. Well, if you can do it once or twice, that indicates something about that tissue, right? It indicates that that tissue is capable, but that it's weak, that it lacks stamina. Mm -hmm. So what it sounds like is if we add stamina to that thing, you might be able to do it longer. Does that sound like a reasonable line of thought? Yeah, I guess it does. Would you like to learn how to add stamina mm. in that specific range of motion? Yeah. Okay. Now we have to go back to the pain conversation from before. It's going to be irritating. This is going to be uncomfortable. Irritation drives adaptation. 
you've been avoiding this for the last 30 years. Because every time you feel something that you dislike, you decide that's a problem I need to stop. But the reality is we're right back on that massage table, except there's no massage therapist. It's just you and you. Mm -hmm. We have to work through this discomfort. That's what's going to give the ankle the ability to be durable. And what's going to happen is you're going to go from I can do it once or twice to I can do it 50 times to I can dance, mm -hmm. period. Mm -hmm. And that that's literally the changing of the self-talk leading to the changing of the identity that, yes, I am okay with pain now. I can actually, I know that the value of it in building the stamina. That's correct. And ultimately bringing people back to those life activities that, so, that really injuries and pain it's exactly right. Move you away from. Very cool, man. Um, as we wrap this up, mm -hmm. is there anything in your heart that you really wanted to speak about? Any, any uh, lingering thoughts before we do? I could, I could go on this lingering thought for, for hours. And I won't do that to the audience. I, I am a firm believer that we are all just a few decisions away from living a completely different life. And as soon as we decide that we have the authority on the decision-making and therefore the authority on the life, all that's left is to take action on it. And so I have an unhealthy habit in some ways. Anybody who listens to this, who sees me on your Instagram account, who wants to send me a DM, I'll answer it. I answer every DM. When people follow me on Instagram, as long as there's not too many in a day, I send them a message thanking them for following me and asking them how I can be of service. 99% of people, more than that, are never going to become clients. They're never even gets to the conversation of becoming clients. But I want to be able to connect you with the resources that I think are going to help you be able to make more authoritative decisions about the life that you want to live. Mm -hmm. And so the more people we can impact in that way, the better. I love that, man. And when people do send you that DM, where are they going? At Dr. Sean Pestuch on Instagram. Okay. And how do you spell your last name, just to make sure? P like Peter, A-S, T like Tom, U-C-H. Listen, I've been a good speller, <laughs> but but still, sometimes that last name, you, you got me sometimes with it. I, I get it. Look, it, yeah. And and active life? Act, so our, we have two Instagram accounts uh, and a website, but... Our account for the people who I think would find the most value out of what we do from this podcast is Active Life RX, like your Active Life prescription. And then our account for professional development is Active Life Professional. Love that, man. What a, what a conversation. I've never had someone sit here and talk about pain specifically, our relationships to pain. But I learned so much. Uh, one thing that really stuck out is that what you said right at the end, that we're only a few decisions away from just changing our lives, which is really empowering mm -hmm. because a lot of us are like, oh no, I'm a few seminars away. No. I'm, I'm, I'm 10 courses away. I'm 15 books away. You know, I'm an ayahuasca ceremony away, mm -hmm. all of this stuff. But it's really, like you said, bringing it back down to you being the leader of your own experience. And we can do this so long as we just change our perspective and change the narrative. And like you said, between the ears and make those decisions. So I thank you so much for coming on the show, man. It was so insightful and I appreciate you. I really had a good time and I appreciate you having me out. <laughs>